The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, it's one small step for man, one giant leap for a bunch of teenagers with stars in their eyes, flags in exile, and ashes of victory. Plus, we continue the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel, and with us is... Victoria Lambert. Who is our intern this spring. Today we have an out-of-this-world interview with Travis S. Taylor and Jody Lynn Nye. Travis and Jody talk Moon Tracks, the sequel to Moonbeam, which takes readers back to the lunar surface where Barbara Winton, who was, the, uh, who was our teenage star of Moonbeam, Dr. Keegan Bright, who is the uh, adult leader of a group of teens that are, uh, that are doing science on the moon and doing it for YouTube, and the rest of the bright sparks embark on dangerous missions. In this case, they're going to race around the moon in a moon buggy race. It's very cool. Travis and Jody are very excited about it and tell us all about it in the interview. What else do we have, Victoria? We continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Excellent. Now here's the news. The March E-Arcs are here. Now, an E-Arc is the 75-degree angle form of a dragon's wings as it hovers over a small peasant village, ready to set fire to thatched roofs and potato fields. Gosh, that, that sounds horrible and horrific, but that's not really what an E-Arc is, is it, Victoria? No, I don't think it is. <laughs> you don't think it is. I'll tell you what it is since, uh, since we're going to freeform what it is. Um, an eARC is an electronic advanced reading copy of a book, and we put these out for readers to buy ahead of time so that you could get the, your favorite author's new, um, new release, say, three to four months before it actually comes out in bookstores and such. Um, the one caveat is, um, do you know what the one caveat is, Victoria? Is it that they have to review the book? No, they don't have to review the book. But that would be great, especially if you like it. Uh, no, it's that they're full of typos still. Um, they've been copy edited, but they have not been proofread yet. So um, this is the same thing that goes out to reviewers as well. It's what used to be called the galleys. And we figured, you know, why not let people uh, who really, really want them uh, go ahead and get them? And, and then you can go buy the hardcover and see if we fixed everything. So it's it's kind of like beta testing for, it, for novels. Exactly. Um, and some and sometimes there's substantial differences, but almost always it's not. It's always, you're pretty much getting the book there. Our first e art is To Clear Away the Shadows by David Drake. This is the new RCN novel that David's bringing out. The crew of the Far Traveler has been tasked with cataloging the new life forms they encounter on their journey through sponge space. But Director of Science Dr. Vale has her own agenda to learn more about the archaic spacefarers who roamed the universe tens of thousands of years before humans reached the stars. The crew of the Far Traveler is poised to hear clear more of the shadows away from the deep past than ever before in human history if they survive. And, of course, this is a Leary and Mundy book, so there will be lots of excitement and plenty of action as well. What else do we have, Victoria? So we've also got Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's A Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 4, E-Arc. Uh, in that, we have a universe of great storytelling from nationally best-selling authors Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Read the shorter works that fill in the cracks of the popular Leaden Universe series, sure to delight longtime fans and newcomers alike. Very cool. Um, and that includes a bunch of the stories that we have uh, printed at Bain.com as lead-ins to some of the Leaden novels as well. So um, there's some great stuff in there. And if you are a Leaden universe completist, such as David Weber is, by the way, um, you'll want to get this. But there's more. We also have out um, this great e-arc from Robert Butner, My Enemy's Enemy. It's a, um, 
excellent book. I'm really excited about this book, um, and I'm the editor on it. The elite terrorist known as the Ass sets his sights on America's heartland. Meanwhile, ambitious aircraft historian Cassidy Gooding and irascible Colorado cowboy Frank Luck unlock an aviation relic's dark secret and discover the terrible truth that the Ass may be closing in on. A secret Nazi superweapon thought to be nothing more than myth might exist after all. It's up to Cass and Frank to stop the ASP. If they fail, millions will perish. What else do we have? We have one more out, don't we, Victoria? That's right. Uh, finally out now is the E-Arc for the year's best military and adventure science fiction volume 5. Edited by David F. Shararad. Yeah, you said it good. Yay. The year's best military and adventure science fiction series roars into its fifth year filled with daring do military combat and edge of your seat suspense. It's a year's worth of the best of the best science fiction from Michael Z. Williamson, Brendan Dubois, Christine Catherine Rush, William Ledbetter, Christopher Rocchio, Stephen Lawson, Suzanne Palmer, Richard Fox, and more. Excellent. The Year's Best Military and Adventure SF, Volume 5, E-Arc, edited by David F. Sherrod. My Enemy's Enemy, E-Arc, by Robert Butner. A Liaden Universe Constellation, Volume 4, E-Arc, by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And To Clear Away the Shadows, New RCN, E-Arc, by David Drake, are now available exclusively at Bane.com. You don't have to wait a single day longer. Go get them and read them now. I want to welcome Jody Lynn Nye and Travis S. Taylor. We want to talk about uh, Moon Tracks this time. Uh, welcome, folks. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. Good to be here. Jody Lynn Nye lists her main career activity as spoiling cats. She lives northwest of Chicago uh-huh, with, th- uh, with her husband, author and packager Bill Fawcett. She has written more than 50 books, including The Ship Who Won with Anne McCaffrey, eight books with Robert Asprin. A uh, humorous anthology about mothers, uh, Don't Forget Your Spacesuit, Dear, and more than 160 short stories. Her, la- and her latest books are Rhythm of the Imperium, uh, which is part of this uh, Imperium series that's kind of like Jeeves in Space, wonderful series. Um, what are some of the other titles in that, Jody? In the Imperium series, View from the Imperium yeah. is the first one, Fortunes of the Imperium is the second, and Rhythm is the third. And she's one of the judges for the Writers of the Future and reviews fiction for Galaxy's Edge and teaches lots of uh, intensive writing workshops at Dragon Con. Travis S. Taylor, Ph.D., um, and many other god dang uh, initials after the name, is the co-creator and star of the National Geographic Channel's hit series Rocket City Rednecks. Um, can also be seen on the Weather Channel, on Three Scientists Walk Into a Bar, on the History Channel, on the Tesla Files. I think that's most recent, although Travis is doing some super secret television thing now, I think. Taylor is, Travis is a physicist who's worked on various programs for the Department of Defense and NASA for the past 20 years. His expertise includes advanced propulsion concepts, large space telescopes, space-based beamed energy systems, future combat technologies, and generation space launch concepts, among many other things. <laughs> Travis is also the author of Cutting Edge Science Fiction, the Toshetti Tos Agenda series, including One Good Soldier. Um, the last book in the series is Kill Before Dying, I believe. That's just out in... Uh, the last book was Bringers of Hell. Right, Bringers of Hell, sorry, which is just out in uh, Mass Market. Um, I think this month or last month, Um, as well as the groundbreaking Warp Speed series. And with Jody, he is the author of Moonbeam. Yep. And now Moon Tracks. And now Moon Tracks. And now at Booksellers Everywhere is Moon Tracks, which is a a sequel, but it's a self-contained book. Um, And it is a a follow-up to Moonbeam, and it it stars the same uh, group of um, kids and adults Maybe um, we could talk a little bit about the genesis of the of this series or these two books. Um, how did it get going, and and what was what's the concept behind it? Before we start diving into the story, 
<laughs> we we, yeah, yeah. we got to yeah, talking go ahead, about wanting to do YA together. Yeah, we were at a party. Uh, I guess we were at uh, was it Liberty Con? I, yes, I, I think. And uh, Jody and I were talking about uh, how we could do a fun book that would excite uh, young people as well as adults in a real fun, adventurous story, but also have hard, modern-day, believable science fiction in it. And uh, we we just kept talking and going over all kind of different ideas. And and then uh, this is finally uh, after, gosh, we we – Went through it for probably a couple of months before he hit the idea that really excited us, I think. Mm-hmm. And so what is the basic idea? Um, what's the big, the, the big concept? The big concept is, well, we, we need to promote STEM, the, the sciences, disciplines, and we want to make, make kids also feel that they can be part of the future. They can be part of helping to make the future. So the stories involve young people, 18, and 18 down to 15, who are coming up with these wonderful projects on the moon that they are designing, they are creating and running under the aegis of Dr. Bright, but they're doing it themselves. And we want to excite kids about the possibility that they too can come up with wonderful projects and that they can make them real. So we have kids who are coming up with fantastically wonderful projects, and one of them is based on Travis's own research. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, one one of the ahead. things that we wanted to do, yeah, one of the things we wanted to do was to create an adult character that is like a, uh, a really fun, uh, exciting character that's kind of like a hero that, that kids and, well, and even adults would aspire to be and look up to. And uh, and but he didn't. We didn't want him to be the main character, although he was kind of a main character. We wanted this, the books to be not about Doctor Bright, but about his apprentices who were who are hoping to be you know or training to be sort of the next Doctor Bright or the next generation of Doctor Brights. And and so it's all about them. It's not, it's not about him. But he's in there along the way as their mentor, kind of nudging them in the right direction if they kind of stray off the path a little. Sometimes coming yeah. up with guiding them towards answers that they would have seen if they weren't in such a tizzy. So there's a, there's a lot there that he's he's pushing them, but making them see what is the useful solution. Yeah, he, yeah, it's kind of fun to read as a as a parent. Yeah, yeah, he's not really he's not really a parent, but they are kind of his kids too. But he but he's the type that he doesn't open the door for the kids, but he'll point them in the direction and show them where the door is. Yeah. Now, and he is, um, he, he's, he's both a brilliant guy and he is, um, he's really aware of this mentor um, aspect. He's a, he's a fun teacher. He's a, he's a really fun character. The kids like him and he, he leaves them alone when they're doing, when they're on track. <laughs> so, um, and the other aspect of it is, is that this is all, uh, it's basically on YouTube, the whole, everything they do, right? Everything they do. It yeah. is very modern in that they're in front of the eyes of the world, and they have to respond to that. They have to keep in mind that what they do, <laughs> the Internet is forever. They have to re- realize that if they're doing something, if, if they're making a mistake, everyone can see it. On the other hand, that makes people feel a little bit more confident in them, that they're not afraid to say, I don't know, and try to make it better, try to make everything work. Yeah, it does. It builds drama between the kids sometimes because there's tension as to who gets the more airtime or, or somewhat, which the older kids don't really care about. But uh, it also builds some drama in that they know that the world is watching and, uh, and, and they have to, you know, live up to that. And, it, and, then, and in this book, uh, Moon Tracks, it actually sort of hits home with our our, our main character, uh, who who doesn't quite realize how big of a deal she's become, and how many people in the world and on the moon are really watching. She's a little embarrassed by it because she, like like a lot of people, she knows what she's doing is cool. She doesn't 
quite realize just how it impacts the people around her, even though she knew that it impacted her when she was watching the show growing up. Yeah, I think that this will appeal to uh, a lot of parents could could buy this for their kids and uh, their kids are going to identify with this i mean i got a i've got a 15 year old and a 12 year old and these youtube personalities that are out there even especially even the scientists and the guys that are um that are doing cool experiments and they have a huge audience unbelievable reach um that uh that perhaps the adult world is not quite aware of yet that's very true oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know, I agree. My, my, uh, ten-year-old son watches these uh, YouTubers play Fortnite, and and he and, and these handful of kids that are like the experts at it have millions of followers, millions, and and now mm-hmm. imagine now this is this is in the future, say whatever the next YouTube is, uh, fifty to a hundred years from now. And there's even more people with more access to this technology. And, the, you know, the, the audience could be vast. I mean, tens to hundreds of millions of people. And we don't overlook the problems with being a YouTube personality either. They get harassed. They have, they have trolls. They have people who are second-guessing them on every turn. And that actually happens now. So how, how to learn to be media savvy without making yourself crazy, uh, that's that's – something that kids have to keep in mind is you have to be able to sit back and say what's happening on the internet is not as important as what is happening right now. Can't obsess about it. Solve the problem. Survive. Talk about it later. Well, let's talk about the book, uh, about the story a little. Um, well, perhaps we could introduce the main character. We follow Keenan Bright, uh, our adult, um, for part of the story, Keegan, but um, we also have uh, Barbara Winton, who's who's the main viewpoint character. Um, how old is Barbara, and what is her role in, in Bright Sparks? Barbara's 16. She comes from Iowa. She did not realize uh, when, when Moonbeam, the first book, began that she had actually won a contest to become part of the Bright Sparks team. They, the other five that were still in the group, uh, there have been many over the years, uh, when the f- show was first, Live from the Moon was first based on Earth, and Keegan's program was on Earth with the kids. When he moved to the moon, his team leader was a girl called Pam Yamashita, or Yamashita, and she was much more, well, to put it gently, independent, and the others were looking for somebody who would be a, a group builder. And Keegan sees that in Barbara and is hoping that she will become the leader of the group, put together these very diverse personalities who all have this wonderful expertise of many different kinds. And her own uh, natural talent is in power supplies. She's terrific at understanding how to, how to make something work, how much is needed, and she's just a math whiz. But her natural talent is in pulling people together. Yeah, she comes from a she comes from a farm, and imagine a hundred years from now on the farm, while they may still be family farms with big equipment that will break down from time to time, and there's a lot of hard work. This equipment is going to be mostly all automated, you know, robotic machinery, and so she's grown up fixing sort of the second hand uh, or, or older, broken down robotic machinery. So she's very hands-on and very good at solving problems right now because the family farm has has depended on it her whole life. And that's and that exactly, is important I, to this story. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's exactly what, what Keegan saw in her. You know, he wanted someone who could see a situation that, that needed an immediate solution that might not be the best perfect solution in a perfect world, but is the one that will work right now and get the job done. And that's what that's what he I think uh, likes about her. And in fact, the rest of the team, the kids seem to like. I think they like that about her as well. They respond to her that she yeah, doesn't she... try to bowl them over with with personality. She tries to reason with them and show them the best solution for now is is it's it's not a matter of ego. It's a matter of of expedience and safety. She's very winning. She's not somebody that's taken with herself at all. 
Yeah, well, it, it's not that uh, – really, I would say out of all of them, she doesn't she doesn't not like Pam, and she doesn't like Pam at first. She's, she's trying to give her the benefit of a doubt, even though the other kids, for whatever reason, can't seem to stand Pam. Uh, she doesn't understand it, and is trying. And she she says, "Well, I like the Sparks, but also from when I met Pam, she seemed like a decent enough person, and she can't get her head around why they can't get along." And that's something yeah. that they have to come come to terms with over the course of of the story as well. Yeah, that's the main part of Moon Tracks is is because Pam was the leader, and she just did not work out, and the kids don't like her. Um, and but Barbara didn't ever know her. Um, I, I, whenever I see Pam pop up in the story, I think of her as like Iceman from uh, Top Gun, that sort of guy, or that sort of person. Well, we kind of saw her that, as Racer X. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> oh, yeah, Racer X. That's funny you say that, that but uh, yeah, you know, if you think about it, in, in Top Gun, Iceman is Racer X. Yep, that's uh, true. That's but, true. That, that, that's funny, but yeah, from the start, from the start, Jody and I were like, uh, Pam has got to be Racer X. I mean, we just, we just, she, uh, she had to be. It was, she had, I mean, that's, it just jumped out at us from when we started writing the story. Yeah. Well, she has to be Racer X because this story is about racing around the moon, which we haven't mentioned yet. And we should say, um, that's what the story is. That's the, the instigation of the story at least. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. What, what is the setup of this, this mighty race? Well, it's uh, the founder of the colony has many, many ideas, uh, which he discusses with, with Keegan Bright. He's, he's definitely a valued consultant to her, that it will help promote living on the moon, that it's someplace to come to. And what could be more exciting than a race? And to do something that has not yet been done in this timeline is to have people racing around the moon in whatever vehicle that that follows the rules that they can whip up to make to make the the transit it's a long way it's dangerous i mean it's deadly and there are excellent really important prizes including publicity and being able to be a part of the bright sparks for a year so of course who wouldn't want to do that that this is like uh sort of the the old uh, navigate a, an airplane across the Atlantic concept, or the first to navigate the ocean concept. This is this is that kind of a race, or you know, kind of like the Iditarod in Alaska. It's it's extremely harrowing, but it's exciting because it it's not many people can do it, or could do it, or would do it. But it's something that needs to be done. And once they start circumnavigating around the moon. Uh, you know, they'll create an infrastructure to to be going around the moon, and and actually, you'll you'll find as you read the book, everything that Keegan Bright does has multiple detailed pieces to larger plans, and the race around the moon isn't just for publicity; uh, it's also to start creating infrastructure for a large project that he's wanting to do. Uh, that's going to take building structures all the way around the moon. And that will make people, uh, industry, more interested in coming to the moon, knowing that it's possible for them to get out and do what they want to, that this has already been considered, as people don't necessarily want to come into bare walls, or in this case, (laughs) the bare plains of the moon. And it gives everybody on earth a chance to focus on this and, and be excited in it and root for their favorite teams. And that's part of why the Sparks want to be a part of it. It's exciting. And of course they, uh, as the home team don't want to be left out of it. They, they want to show their stuff. They want to prove that they're worthy competitors as well. Yeah. And it, it just sort of, rem- uh, well, one thing, uh, so that big project that Dr. Dr. Uh, Bright is after, isn't it like a, it's a large, it's a giant particle beam accelerator that circles the moon or something like that, right, Travis? Right. When you build a particle accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider here on Earth, you have to build a big chamber that you can create a vacuum in uh, so that your particle can can not collide with air molecules while it's going along. 
But on the moon, since there's no atmosphere, once you get above a few inches off the surface, there then then you've got the vacuum for free. And Keegan has the idea that uh, you could build your particle accelerator around the circumference of the moon with by just putting the uh, accelerator coils and not have to build all the infrastructure for the vacuum chamber and all that. And, then, and you could build the largest particle accelerator mankind's ever built, and it would take us to another level of physics. And so it's, it's a fun idea, and uh, it's a possible idea that I think, uh, you know, we'd actually consider once we start going back to the moon. And uh, it is, it is just perfect that Keegan and the Bright Sparks would be somehow involved with the creation of it. <clears throat> and then things begin to go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, tell us a little bit more about the team and what they have put together with the Spark Express, um, or what they're trying to <laughs> when we start, because they haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> they had big, big plans, and the trouble with big plans is you need time to execute them. And in this case, everything takes longer than you think it's going to. So they start to run into trouble right there, and that is at the base of almost every project that ever was, you're going to run over in time if you're not careful, if you're not good at time management, if you don't really think about all the problems that you may possibly have, and they fall right into that trap. Yeah, you, so never as we... it, you never know how long it's going to take, for example, to get a part. Now, if you're on the moon, it's going to take even longer because a lot of the parts are going to have to come from Earth. And there's some of these things that are just the, the larger systems engineering and systems integration of a big program, like putting together a, a, a buggy that you can race around the moon and live in for a week or two, uh, that's just a bigger deal. Uh, then the, these kids really, really thought through at the start. Yeah, well, it's part of uh, Dr. Bright's plan is to is to as part of his teaching method is to throw them in the deep end, right? That's the... oh, let let them oh, walk yeah. into the deep end. I he may have he may have planted the seed in their mind, but he is going to let them do it. He was always going yeah. to let them execute their own program, and. With that comes the consequences of not doing it right. So the different buggy. All right. One other thing I want to ask Travis is, um, didn't you in real life have something to do with a moon buggy race? Um, I, I sort of recall. Oh, yeah. So uh, in in Huntsville at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, they have a, uh, a big uh, great moon buggy race every year. And uh, they call it something different now, I forget, but that uh, we uh, wanted to show that that uh, you could build a moon buggy with uh, with simpler parts that you could that have to be man propelled and you could do it while wearing spacesuits. And so me and uh, my, my buddies built the moon race and we entered the race only honorarily. We we couldn't win. We didn't plan to win or whatever. It's just to show as a demonstration because it's for college kids. But me and uh, uh, my uh, brother-in-law uh, actually got built spacesuits, and then we, me and my buddies built the buggy, and we rode it through the course. And we wanted to show these kids that get in the race every year, they always just build, like, really nice bicycle kind of systems that you you wear biking shorts and and uh, and – and you you could be very athletic about, and we want to show them. Let's well, think it through. If it really was on the moon, then you have to think about all the things on the moon. You'd be in a spacesuit that's hard to move around in. You know, mm-hmm. the moon course is the moon course is more difficult uh, when you when you look at it from that perspective. And and so that's kind of the idea that we're we're getting across in this book is, uh, you know, everything on the moon is twice as hard. 10 times as hard, 100 times as hard as it would be from just doing it on the earth. And and that's why our, our, our kids, the Bright Sparks, really do come shining through with some really wonderful uh, charisma and, and, and ideas that I think are a lot of fun. Yeah. What are the... Um... 
what what is the propulsion technique? So each of the moon buggies sort of has a different propulsion technique, right? Is that part of the idea? What are some of those? Uh, for the the different teams are called pod. Let's see the the. I don't know what the teams are called, but there's there's pod racer, solar storm, cheetah, firebird, Apollo's chariot, some others. Um, we have the the bright sparks team Sol star. We have the the um, uh, team polymer ace, uh, team firebird, team solar wind, team Doppler, team techno mage, uh, team Helios, and there are a couple of others that uh, that were a lot of fun to come up with. They're from all over the world. What is some of the science behind the propulsion techniques that they that their buggies use? Well, most of them are some iteration. Well, actually, all of them are are some iteration on electric propulsion. Uh, you know, because that's what it's going to have to be on the moon. Is you have stored power or collected power from your solar panels that you then uh, transfer into uh, a generator slash motor system. Whether they're brushless motors or superconducting motors or whatever, it's just it's whatever the engineering take is on being most efficient in converting their battery power to, um, you know, an electric motor system to drive your wheels. Now, the Sparks, on the other hand, have a secret weapon. There's no rules about um, having uh, propulsion systems that are more exotic. It's just that you can't fly. Your system, has, your, your buggy has to be in a buggy. So the Sparks actually use a propulsion system that they experimented with for uh, satellite propulsion in the first book that uh, in uh, uh, Moonbeam which is uh, based on a, a theory that you can uh, apply microwaves to a certain shaped cavity and it will give you propellantless propulsion. So this is some sort of EM. Yeah, it's, 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 known, yeah. As it's, EM, it's known nowadays, if you wanted to Google it and see, you know, some ideas about it that are being researched, it's called the M drive, EM drive for electromagnetic drive. Uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, being tested by NASA and some other folks and, it's still in its infancy and still even being debated as to why it, it works and even if it works well enough to be a propulsion system. But uh, I'm of the uh, of the belief, and actually I've seen enough experimental evidence, I'm pretty sure it works. The question is how well and, and, and what the physics are behind it. We'll get there someday. Yeah, but it's definitely real and it's cutting edge. Yes, the whole idea is to have science that we can have somebody, we can have people debating because the whole idea is to make it as real as we possibly can, based on what we know now. Mm -hmm. So, so what goes wrong, Jody? <laughs> 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 well, there are mechanical problems. There are uh, there are going to be times when they assume to that something was going to work that doesn't. And they're going to run into problems based upon the technology not being as perfect as they hoped it would be. When you order something, for example, uh, but you're not there at the manufacturer, you may run into trouble because it might not be up to the stats that you assumed it would be. And that is going to put you in real problems. I don't want to give away too much. Yeah. Well, what is uh, what about the contention with the other teams? Um, so Pam is back, and she is Racer X. She's working for who? The she's the Solar. Uh... She she works for Solstar. Solstar in there. Their their very beautiful buggy is called Blue Streak, and it's it's really a work of art. It really is, and it has an elegant drive system to it. The the it's not wheels so much as, as uh, hollow, almost lacy balls that the, the buggy runs on, and that means that it's not going to get bogged down in the moon dust because it will just shed it. But she's, she's watching them. She's watching them. And, and, and the team members on her team, are, it, you sort of describe them in a way that makes me feel that they're almost like uh, Randians. <laughs> they're... They're like all individualists who are who have come together to promote themselves. People, people who get interested in a project are are driven in their own way. 
So I don't think the team members, if you're talking about the Spark. No, I was thinking about the, no, I was talking about uh, Pam's team. Oh, no. So the way I see Pam's team is their corporate team. Um, their job was to to go do the race, and they uh, had to be a team because it's going to be a dangerous thing, and they wouldn't send pure uh opposing individuals to do a job like that in such a dangerous situation, but they are, they're professionals kind of like an astronaut team before they have trained together for months and months and months for a mission there. They, they got into it to be astronauts and they may not know each other, uh, but on the first day of the, they get together to start training. They're there as professionals to do the job and to work together. In a way, mm-hmm. it's Pam's own yeah, baggage she, that is the, the sticking point. She has still, in her own way, which is very different from many other ways, a kind of loyalty to the team, and that is going to stick in the craw of her some of her associates, perhaps. But it it's also makes things a little bit interesting because it gives her a conflict that she has to resolve. Yeah. And she's the sort of the principal antagonist, and and she's not really a, a bad person at all. They're they're going to have to figure out how to deal with each other. But she's someone that that is getting in is getting in their faces at first a little bit. Or is that their own perception of that case? I would say that it's more of their own perception based on whatever the events of the past were. The, the Sparks are still kind of living in that past moment when it comes to Pam, and Pam has kind of moved on. Uh, and, and that's where Barbara is stuck in between the two of them because she wasn't there in the past, and she's only there in the present now. And uh, so she doesn't really know how to deal with the whole situation at first. Now, this is where the blogging and the online uh, connections also play onto things because when you have watched somebody on television or you have read their books, you think you know them, but you you don't really. So she's left with the impressions that she got from reading the vlogs and watching their exploits and things, but she doesn't really have enough information to go on. So she's feeling her way, trying to get past the, the hurt feelings of her friends and her loyalty to them, but she also sees the truth. She's she's a very practical girl. One of the other things that I wanted to bring up that I almost forgot about, actually, but um, that is really cool in the book is this crazy app that leads some of the teams to ruin. Even that they're they're it's sort of like a Pokemon Go for songs or what is it? Yep, it is exactly that. It's it's a it's a game that uh, I came up with that is of that sort of type of game, and it's distracting. And even really well-meaning, uh, focused individuals can get caught up in things like that, and it's happening today. When 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 you can see a YouTube video of somebody walking along the street uh, with their nose in their phone and falling into a sewer because they were literally uh, nose down and not paying any attention. So, yeah, you, you can run into real trouble with, with something like that, with a, an incredible distraction. And it doesn't help that the manufacturers of the game have – put special things out there for the players. I don't think that they thought it through of what that could actually mean in uh, <laughs> out, out in the field. Yeah, it's the, the, I mean, I've almost killed myself with GPS before, so <laughs> I can completely understand. If you, if you trust it, uh, there, there have been people who've driven down goat tracks because the GPS said it was a road. Do you believe yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you must, especially because you have no idea where you are anymore. <laughs> so, but, um, uh, speaking of where you are, can you tell us where you are, Travis, or is it another super secret project you can't reveal? Uh, well, today I'm actually in Hollywood. Uh, so, yeah, I can't tell you what, what my new project is, but it is going to be the most amazing thing that I've ever done. Uh, cool. And so wow. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a few months, I mean, it's very Indiana Jones. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Uh, so in, in, a, in a few months, hopefully I'll be able to talk about it a little more. Uh, but what I am also doing is uh, I'm uh, 
I'm a full cast member on Ancient Aliens uh, uh, last season and this season too, and so I'm also going to film an episode of Ancient Aliens tomorrow. Um, but uh, the the new project is something that will be near and dear to all of our uh, uh, our types of of fandom out there in the in, in the SF world. Uh, they will be really hard. excited about what's going. Cool, cool. Well. Sounds wonderful. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, it's one of those things that uh, I really wish I could talk about, but I had to sign all sorts of agreements not to because uh, History Channel wants to keep it a, a big secret right until I think they're going to announce it in June. Uh, so we'll just have to wait until then. Oh, man, that sounds really cool. Can't wait for that. So... Um, well, back back to the story. What is going on with Doctor Bright in the story? Where is he? And um, he's on the far side of the moon, for one thing. Mm-hmm. He's he's out on a project of his own, and it's tied in with the collider, but also tied in with finances. The the yeah, so sort of the running joke with every kind of scientific project that there ever was is we need more funding. And right. the moon has and, and, lots and lots of resources. And, and that's something that uh, we wanted to point out that a lot of people don't really realize. You know, the, the Russians, uh, ever since uh, Stalin, uh, was actually manipulating the diamond market without anybody knowing it. And they've only recently revealed it within the last couple of years that they've been doing this all along because there's this huge meteor impact crater out near Siberia. And uh, when they would, they, they became a prison mine, effectively. Uh, when they ship people off to prison, they would send them out there to work in this meteor crater because the impact crater created diamonds, all sorts of diamonds. And so, and they're still mining it today, getting tons of diamonds out of this big impact crater. And if you look at the moon, there are meteor impact craters all over the moon, and there's bound to have been some of those impact scenarios that were just right to create a similar diamond mine. And so uh, uh, Egan uh, uh, is looking into things along this line and hoping to find you know other possibilities for funding, and when he does, he doesn't find diamonds. He finds something as, as equally useful and and uh, and a resource that they can make all sorts of money off of. But also diamonds. And I don't know if I should say. I don't know if I should. I didn't know if I, I don't know if I should say what the other resource is. No, I. I we're we're not gonna, we're not going to reveal that yet. All right. No. Well, let's not. But in, one of the things that does happen is that he he gets um, in a little bit of danger, and one and the, once again. Um, the bright sparks are going to have to um, try to help him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Doctor Bright always in a sort of a a way that the the sparks never really know is always coming to their rescue without them knowing it. Well, and we thought it would be a good time uh, to show that maybe the sparks could uh, could pay back the favor, so to speak. Now, does this uh, divert them from the race? What is um... What is the middle of the, yeah, uh, what are some of the, what, I wanted to get into some of the, the, the issues that the racers face, I guess, that, um, that to circumnavigate the moon is no small feat. Well, you have to have right. a, a, healthy, a healthy system that is able to store power while you have sunlight and dispense it in, in a, reasonable fashion once you are without it and if you run out of power you're in trouble and you're probably out of the race there are uh, fatigue it? is an enormous fatigue is an enormous problem when you are traveling long long distances because they just yeah, keep there's going, also, and going there's also a uh, there's a navigation issue uh you know since we haven't circumnavigated the moon and there aren't necessarily gps satellites that are fully covering the moon yet, uh, then, you know, they have to figure out ways to navigate themselves. Now, the race team did put up safety markers outside a very large band, 
around the moon that's many miles thick. So it is still possible for them to get lost, take a bad path that leads them to a, a ravine or a crevice or a mountain. Uh, I mean, it's it, just imagine if you weren't to try and circumnavigate the Earth uh, and and there were no oceans. Uh, there's it would be difficult to find paths. You know, it took them years and years to find a path across the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so it, it, it's a uh, it's a fun and adventurous endeavor. There's also plain old human nature of uh, there. All those teams are going this way. We'll go that way. Pardon me if my moon uh, geography is not <laughs> up to date, but isn't the far side of the moon a lot more pitted with craters than than the one facing the Earth? N- no. Uh, uh, no, not really. No. <laughs> it, 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 that would be like saying, "Isn't one side of the Earth more pitted than the other side?" Now, uh, what what you can see is there are different there are different kinds of spacings, and there are certain fields that have different types of materials in it. But it's just like the Earth; it's still sort of a, a random sampling based on what's happened to the Moon over billions of years. You can find okay. some really interesting places. There, there are uh, there are big fields that have fragile crust, and there, there's one of, one of them is is the sort of hole in the moon that I think is a really interesting feature. But they're going to try and and be as safe as they can. They're going to try and get around safely. They're going to have to take detours and go back because some of the pathways that look like a good route uh, just don't go through staying on the surface and they're going to run into various problems based upon the structure of their vehicles we have one ship uh, one buggy that goes nose down because it on planes it would be fine uh, but it can also it's also kind of top uh, front heavy but it, it can plow ahead like nobody's business under certain circumstances, and they're all going to have a flaw or two that is a feature in other places. One other thing that um, I don't know if it came into y'all's mind when you're writing this, but this <laughs> I kept thinking about the Wacky Racers cartoon when uh, I was reading. Of course, um, I did. <laughs> of course. And I kept thinking of Pam as that dastardly guy. Anyway, but <laughs> and you and you had Muttley going. <laughs> In the background. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> and obviously Speed Racer was an influence as well. You're gonna have Huge. Them. Yeah, we, we actually had uh we had several speed racer talks while we were uh plotting out the book, uh because we knew from the beginning that Pam was gonna be our Racer X character. And we even knew we even knew Pam was gonna be Racer X from the previous book, we just didn't know exactly how we were going to manifest that then. <clears throat> and and we're not through so with her just... yet. <laughs> she's she's a great yeah, character. Right. Yeah, she's a great foil for for them. So, um, what is going on? Uh, what is next? What's happening with? Um, are we going to see more of uh, of the Bright Sparks? And which what projects are you both working on um, individually? Well, I've got three things underway. Uh, one of them is the next Myth Adventures book. Um, got a couple of things that are just a little bit too uh, in the beginning stages for me to really want to talk about. Well, jo- Jody, you have a story out now in Voices of the Fall, uh, which is out this month, uh, which is the Black Tide Rising anthology. Um, That's a great right. story in there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hey, I had a, I, is that the one that I had a story in? No, uh, you do too. That's right. Travis has one too. <laughs> I'm right. sorry. Both of you have stories in in uh, in that. So out this month is Voices of the Fall, edited by John Ringo and Gary Poole, which is um, the Black Tide Rising two sort of anthology, the second one that they've done, set in John's world. Um, and Travis's uh, Bringers of Hell is out in mass market right now. Um, at Bookstillers. Um, what about uh, future projects? So I'm actually behind. I've been uh, working on uh, TV, and I've got a big thing going on with my day job, uh, building a quantum entanglement teleportation experiment. So my time has been <laughs> overly monopolized by, by both of those projects. And and I had a uh, – I just turned in 
uh, a text, uh, a college uh, undergraduate textbook called Introduction to Laser Science and Engineering to my textbook publisher. And that took, you know, textbooks just take way too much time. And uh, I'm, I, I hope I don't plan to do one of those for another few years. And, and uh, anyway, I have um, uh, Battle Luna is 70% done. I've just got to finish doing some editing and, and write a, one more short story for it. And, uh, and that's, that's got a story from Tim Zahn and one from uh, uh, Mad Mike Williamson in it. And um, I actually wish I had one more author that could do a story for it. Um, and then what kind, I, of, what I, kind uh, of story? It, uh, it's, a, uh, it's about uh, kind of a, the, the very first shooting war. Kind of, it kind of be like the Revolutionary War uh, on the moon. Uh, that the, and it's more about the details of not the politics of the war, but the in on the boots on the ground war uh, that's happening, and it's based on the this colony. It's not much much more advanced than the colony in actually ain't even as advanced as the colony in uh, Moon Moonbeam, and they find this alien faber uh, while mining the moon, and as they're trying to reverse engineer the the faber. That they, they basically give it any blueprint and it'll print out anything as long as it has the raw materials. Um, various entities on Earth thinks it's theirs, and the colony on the moon thinks it's theirs, and hence becomes a revolutionary war over this fabric. And Big um, I mean, yeah, right. Uh, and it turns out that France is going to be the uh, the producers of the uh, fabric uh, originally. Uh, and, and it's going to be similar transit times like it would have been during the Revolutionary War for Navy crossings and so on between various allies. And so that's sort of the general premise of, of, of Battle Luna. And then um, um, I, I, Les Johnson just sent me half of our, our, our book that we're working on. That's uh, our, ne- our ne- Mine and Les's next collaboration, and it's about taking uh, the first uh, non-faster-than-light mission to Alpha Centauri, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of special relativity romance uh, problems that take place there. Um, oh, that's cool. Romance maybe. Yeah, <laughs> romance may be a little too strong of a word, but uh, um, <laughs> you can imagine that. Well, I always love that Heinlein book where they have that going on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of it's kind of similar, you know. One of the guys that goes on the first mission wasn't expected to go, and and uh, and his wife is pregnant when he leaves, and uh, and now he's going to be gone for, you know, thirty years or however long uh, on in regular time, but only uh, you know a few years, six, five or six years, you know, his time. But still, he would have missed his child growing up, maybe, unless. His his wife could somehow manage to get on the next next ship out or something. Huh. That sounds really intriguing. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm working on, and I've got and I've got uh, uh, my ballistic series is still percolating, and I've written I'll write a little here and there on it, and I'm way I'm a year behind on it, but I'm starting to get. Oh the yeah, ball we got a, on we have a contract up. on that. We have a contract on that. You're going to write it, right? <laughs> All right. Yes, so. I am going to write it. I am going to write it. I am writing it. It's just taking me a while with all my various projects hitting me all at once. Sure, sure, sure. Well, why don't you use that quantum teleportation device you're creating to to duplicate yourself? There's a thing in quantum uh, physics called the no cloning rule. And, uh, in fact, physics limits you and will not allow you to clone yourself. From, from a yeah. quantum mechanical standpoint, from a quantum mechanical aspect, you, know, you might get clone yourself from a biological aspect. That's a completely different thing. Well, that's probably a good thing. Built into the universe, <laughs> and ultimately. <laughs> and uh, ancient aliens uh, will be the next place we see you on TV. Yeah, um, yeah. Just keep a watch. Uh, I was on it all this. It comes on Friday nights. Uh, I'm, I'll be on most of those you see, and. Uh, uh, the new season will probably start early summer. We're filming. We've already filmed some new episodes, and we've got another half of the season to finish filming. But yeah, keep a watch there.
And are y'all both going to be at Dragon Con? Do you think this year? Yes, absolutely. I teach that I know, the Joe, writers' workshop there. Yep. Yeah. That will depend on. That's going to depend on this new project because uh, it's going to require me to be on location for many we actually for several weeks at a time. So I don't know my schedule yet. Uh, okay. Well, be careful out there wherever or whatever it is. <laughs> Make sure that that giant ball doesn't crush you when you're running from it. <laughs> right? I hope not. Well, out now, booksellers everywhere is Moon Tracks by Travis S. Taylor and Jody Lynn and I, and uh, it is uh, in hardcover at the moment and in ebook form. We have a wonderful cover on this that um, I thought was really, really caught the idea of, uh, of Barbara very well. That is a Dominic Harmon cover. Yeah, people have been yeah, telling Lord. me how impressed they are by those. And Travis and Jody, thank you so much for uh, talking with us about Moon Tracks. Thank you for having us. Oh, I loved it. It's always fun to talk about our uh, wonderful characters that we've come to know and love over the past year of writing them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Now this was just embarrassing. In a way, I'm flattered that you'd believe such rumors about me, but I'm not in the habit of doing things that could cause my order to be blackmailed, especially in this hive of stinging insects. I swear, all these fools do is try to blackmail each other. It's like the favored sport in the capital. Lord Protector Devadas sat across the table from Rada in the small study. Servants had brought in refreshments and then left the two alone so they could speak privately. No offense intended, if there are any politicians you're overly fond of. The list of people Rada actually liked was a very short one. No offense has been given. It felt odd to give such a formal answer. Other than that, and the part where you tried to lie to Blunt Karna, a man who can sense lies like a soaring eagle can spot rabbits. Your plan showed initiative. Well done, Senior Archivist Radamantha. Thank you. He was only humoring her, but she'd take the compliment. Even though she'd seen him outraged in the Chamber of Argument, and he'd been furious enough to duel then, and perfectly polite now, Rada couldn't help but be intimidated by this man. There was just something about him that told her this was the most dangerous individual she'd ever met. And that included the Inquisition wizard who'd threatened her. That danger made him a lot more interesting than the scribes she normally associated with. Please, call me Rada. Wine? He poured her a glass. Up close, he was older than she'd expected, probably ten years her senior. Devadas had a kind smile, but it was offset by the massive scar that crossed his face. He caught her looking and touched the white line with his fingers. This? I received it in a duel. Needless to say, I lost. 
I didn't mean to stare. It is kind of hard to miss. This is my little reminder that one shouldn't try to take something that isn't his. But that was a long time ago. There was no way this man could have ever stolen anything. I'm sure you've won many jewels since, Rada said, and then realized how stupid that sounded. A few, but as a swordsman gets older, he understands there are some fights he's not meant to win. Now, your identity is safe, and your visit is only known to people who I trust. Not even the strongest wizards can spy within these walls. You can speak freely here. Earlier, it had been easy to think about lying to the protectors about her own crimes, but with those piercing eyes looking through her, such an omission had suddenly become very difficult. I recently provided a report to the judges concerning the legal history of the untouchables. I was there that day. His expression suggested he'd enjoyed it as much as she had. That's when I saw you and knew you'd help, she exclaimed, and wished that she hadn't, because that sounded childish. I mean, you were actually honest. That isn't necessarily a positive trait in the capital. I brought shame to my order and discovered I lacked the temperament for court. Other protectors will be handling those duties on my behalf from now on. Devadas shook his head as if the whole thing was rather amusing. What can I help you with? Rada's mouth was suddenly very dry. She drank more of the wine without even tasting it. The report. There was a problem. For someone as devoted to the ideals of the library as Rada was, this was like admitting to the foulest deed possible. Feeding babies to demons would have been better. The report was inaccurate. Devadas blinked slowly. And? On purpose. It wasn't my fault. I was forced to leave things off, but only because I was threatened. They'd kill me if I didn't. Oh. He sensed her hesitation. Listen, you might have broken the law, but I'm not going to judge you now. The law allows leniency for crimes committed under duress. The important thing is that you're trying to correct your mistake. You're safe. I won't allow anyone to hurt you. It was so easy to believe him that Rada told of the events in the archives. Devadas listened intently the entire time, and his expression darkened when she spoke of the Inquisitor. When she was done, he seemed to weigh his words very carefully. That is troubling. I'll do my best to find this man, but you have no evidence this wizard was actually from another order, let alone one as important as the Inquisition, and you can't take a criminal at his word. She certainly hoped he was right about that, but the sabotage worried her. But what of the conspiracy? The missing pages? The order of the Inquisition is powerful, and frankly, currently better favored in this city than either of our orders. You can't expect me to accuse the Inquisition of wrongdoing on just your word. That stung. Then I didn't need to dress up and make a fool of myself to come here. I'm not disparaging you. It was wise to be discreet. Besides, I think you look lovely. Devada said, obviously trying to put her at ease. And just for a moment, his smile was so damned charming that Rada could see how rumors got started. This isn't the first time the threat of violence has been used to sway the making of law. What is it they forced you to leave out? It was some ancient history about the beginning of the castes. References to the origins of the untouchables were struck from all of our newer records. The whole thing sounded insane to put into words. Her father had often told her that good information was the foundation of good law, but someone was trying to sabotage that foundation. She found the whole thing incredibly offensive. 
I think those advocating for their slaughter are fools. I can reassure you that I honestly don't think anything will change. I hope you're right. It was surprising how Devadas could go from charming to somber so quickly. I don't hope. I fight. I think about logistics. There are whole regions of Locke where the majority of the residents are casteless. Some houses depend on their labor to feed themselves. Our nation would rip itself apart. Most of the judges aren't foolish enough to do something like that. But if they are... Devadas shrugged. We can't allow them to hurt the untouchables. That isn't our decision to make. The council will decide. Laws will be written. And then we'll follow them. You don't understand, Lord Protector. The law only exists because of the castless. Devadas laughed. The most perfect system of governance in the history of the world exists because of the castless. I have proof. Rada took out her glasses case and reached beneath the padding for the folded scrap of paper she'd hidden there. She regretted not wearing gloves, and as delicately as possible, extracted the damaged treasure. This was the page I was reading when I was attacked. She wanted to be clear that she would never willingly damage a library book. I accidentally tore it out when that man grabbed me. She placed it on the table and steered it toward Devadas. He stared at it. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you read? All protectors are literate. I meant no offense. Just that most warriors... Actually, I was born into the first caste. When I'm not traveling the countryside cracking skulls like a barbarian, I enjoy books. He read the scrap. Rada bit her lip, hoping he would believe her. She didn't have her glasses on, but she'd memorized what it said. The Lord Protector finished and was quiet for a very long time. How old is this? The original is from the dawn of the Age of Law. This was a copy transcribed hundreds of years after. You believe this to be accurate? Of course. That's one of the duties of my order. To preserve the words of older documents, we often make new ones. Now we use the press, but this is how it was done for generations. We pride ourselves on our accuracy. I'd have more evidence, but this is exactly the sort of thing that's been stolen. I've been afraid to return to the restricted collection to search for more. She'd seen that her father had posted more guards around the library, so hopefully the saboteurs had been scared off but she suspected their work was already done. Devadas was deep in thought. He finished off his wine and set the cup down far too hard. The idea of a conspiracy offends me. I will personally oversee this investigation. If they find out I told you, protectors of the law aren't known for our discretion. We're usually more direct in our investigations, but you have my word that I will do my best. Devadas reached out and placed one rough hand on top of hers. Rada was surprised that she was suddenly feeling very flushed. Even with the scar, the Lord Protector was perhaps the most handsome man she'd ever seen. He let go of her hand and stood up. You'll be safe. I'll have my men escort you back to your estate. Rada surprised herself by exclaiming, Wait! Devadas paused. What? She didn't want to leave yet. My disguise, the rumors, Radha blurted. She had no idea what she was doing. Maybe Daksha was right, and it was time to have some experiences worth writing about. For once, she was doing something extremely important. She actually felt pretty, and that made her bold. And on the spot... Rada decided that, damn it, she was going to seduce this protector. Maybe it would be safer if I returned to my estate in the morning instead. I see, Devada smiled. It turned out that some rumors were true.
That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to Victoria Lambert and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. The gift of spring sprunging all around from Saturn to Mars to this weird little blue rock we call home. Plus thanks, praise, and plaudits to Jody Lynn Nye and Travis S. Taylor, authors of Moontracks. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Stars.